Patients in DKA are at risk of developing potassium abnormalities. Let's go into detail of what's happening with the potassium in DKA. Make sure to check out our previous video where we discuss the pathophysiology, causes and clinical features of DKA. So here we have the blood and here we have the cells of our body. Remember, anything which is inside the cells is inside the intracellular compartment and everything outside of the cells is called the extracellular compartment. About 98% of the potassium in our body is in the intracellular compartment. It is very important to maintain potassium levels in this high concentration inside cells because this helps to maintain a normal resting membrane potential. It is also important to regulate the serum potassium levels. High serum potassium levels is called hyperkalemia. Low serum potassium levels is called hypokalemia. The big problem with hyperkalemia and hypokalemia is that both these conditions can cause dangerous cardiac arrhythmias. So it's very important to maintain the serum potassium levels within its normal range, which is generally between 3.5 and 5.5 millimoles per liter. One of the most important structures that maintains the intracellular potassium levels and the serum potassium levels is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This pump pulls two potassium ions from the blood into the cells and pushes three sodium ions out of the cells into the blood. Now let's talk about insulin. As we talked about in the last video, insulin has very important metabolic effects with regards to glucose metabolism and fat metabolism. But insulin also has a very important function with regards to regulating the serum potassium levels. When insulin binds to its receptor on cells, it will stimulate an intracellular signaling cascade. This cascade has effects on the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. This cascade will increase the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pumps. So insulin, through its effects on the sodium potassium ATPase pumps, will cause potassium to shift from the blood into the cells. This function of insulin should make sense if you think about it. After eating a meal, the blood glucose levels rise and this stimulates the release of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. And insulin helps to lower the blood glucose levels by stimulating the uptake of glucose from the blood into peripheral tissues. But remember, after eating a meal, the serum potassium levels will also rise so insulin will also help to lower the serum potassium levels after eating meals by stimulating the sodium potassium ATPase pumps and causing potassium to shift towards the intracellular compartment. Now let's think about DKA. If you guys remember in the last video, one of the things that characterizes DKA is an absolute insulin deficiency in the body. This led to that biochemical triad of hyperglycemia, ketonemia, and acidosis. Now let's think about what happens with the potassium. If there's no insulin in the body, that means that there's no insulin to bind to its receptors on the cells. And this will mean that intracellular signaling pathway will not take place. And this means that insulin will not be able to exert its effects on the sodium potassium ATPase pumps and cause potassium to shift from the blood into the cells. This will mean that potassium will stay and build up in the blood and increase the serum potassium levels and increase the risk of the patient developing hyperkalemia. But remember, even though the serum potassium level is increasing, the intracellular potassium level is decreasing. So the effective potassium that the cells can use is decreasing. And this means that patients in DKA are actually potassium depleted. There are other mechanisms which are also driving potassium out of the cells. DKA is characterized by a metabolic acidosis, which is characterized by a buildup of hydrogen ions in the blood. Check out our previous video to understand why there is a metabolic acidosis. The body has a number of ways to try to deal with this metabolic acidosis. The bicarbonate in the blood will try to buffer these hydrogen ions. Patients in DKA will also perform cosmol breathing to try to breathe off the carbon dioxide in the blood and try to compensate for this metabolic acidosis through the respiratory system. The body has another way to try to deal with this acidosis. On the membrane of the cells, there is a channel which allows hydrogen ions in the blood to move into the cells and in exchange it allows potassium ions in the cells to move out of the cells into the blood. It's important to note that although this mechanism helps to bring some hydrogen ions out of the blood, this mechanism will not correct the metabolic acidosis as there are still ketone bodies in the blood which will keep producing hydrogen ions. So the only true way to correct the metabolic acidosis in DKA is to stop the production of ketone bodies. And again, the big problem with this mechanism is that potassium is being shifted from the cells to the blood. So the serum potassium levels will increase again as potassium is being shifted. But remember, even though the serum potassium level is increasing, the potassium inside the cells is decreasing. So patients are actually getting potassium depleted. There is one more mechanism to discuss. 
Remember, DKA is characterized by hyperglycemia, which is high levels of glucose in the blood. The big problem with this glucose is that it is very osmotically active. And this means that glucose in very high concentrations can pull water from the cells into the blood. When this happens, this can create a potassium gradient between the intracellular compartment and the extracellular compartment. And potassium inside the cells can also leave the cells into the blood down that concentration gradient. And again, this mechanism will increase the serum potassium levels. But because the cells of the body are losing this potassium, patients are actually getting potassium depleted. So to summarize, we've talked about three mechanisms which are causing potassium to be shifted from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment. So overall, there is a total body loss of potassium. So patients in DKA are actually getting potassium depleted. This is why in patients with suspected DKA, it's very important to consider starting potassium replacement as soon as you can. Remember, if the patient's kidneys are working well, the patient should be able to excrete the extra potassium in the blood out into the urine. And so patients with good kidney function will usually present with normal serum potassium levels. It should then make sense that patients who present with hyperkalemia and high serum potassium levels will usually have reduced kidney function. And this usually happens because patients develop a pre-renal acute kidney injury. Let's talk about how this happens and why patients develop hyperkalemia. If you guys remember from the last video, we talked about how there were very severe volume losses in DKA, particularly due to the severe polyuria that patients develop in DKA. The problem with this volume loss is that it can lead to a reduction in the blood volume, and this is called hypovolemia. The problem with this hypovolemia is that it can reduce blood flow to the kidneys, and this renal hypoperfusion is very problematic. If there is less blood going to the kidneys, that means that there is less blood getting filtered by the kidneys, and this means that there is a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate. And this is the basic pathophysiology of a pre-renal acute kidney injury. Acute kidney injury refers to a sudden decline in renal function over a couple of hours or days. One of the big problems that patients with an acute kidney injury develop is oliguria. Oliguria refers to a severely reduced urine output. Remember, in DKA, there is an increase in the serum potassium levels. And if patients are not producing urine, that means that the kidneys will not be able to excrete the extra potassium in the blood out into the urine. So the potassium will stay in the blood. And so as potassium is not being excreted from the blood, patients develop hyperkalemia. So this is how patients in DKA can present with hyperkalemia, as they usually develop a pre-renal acute kidney injury. So let's summarize the key potassium abnormalities. Potassium is being shifted from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment and overall there is a total body loss of potassium. So this is why it's very important to consider giving potassium replacement in DKA. The serum potassium level will generally increase but if the patient's kidneys are working well then the serum potassium should be normal. If the patients develop an acute kidney injury the serum potassium level might be very high and they might present with hyperkalemia. Patients can also develop potassium abnormalities during the management of DKA. We will discuss the management of DKA in a future video, but for now, just remember, part of the management of DKA involves giving fixed rate infusions of insulin. Insulin will help correct the hyperglycemia, the ketonemia, and the acidosis in DKA. But another thing it does is that it will lower the serum potassium levels, because remember, it will stimulate the sodium potassium ATPase pumps and cause potassium to shift from the blood into the cells. So this will help restore the potassium levels in the intracellular compartment. However, the serum potassium level will continue to decrease, and this increases the risk of the patient developing hypokalemia. So this is why it's very important to regularly monitor the serum potassium levels when patients are being managed for DKA.